This is about uh, 7 a.m. Uh, we're getting our launch and entry suits on and uh, getting them all checked out before we go out to the vehicle. It's going out to the crew van. I think uh, if I could remember the time, about, I'd say, 7.50 in the morning. Out on the pad, and about this time during the count, uh, you really start uh, putting your thinking hat on because uh, you've got to go to work. And uh, main engines start running, and we run them for about six seconds. The computers make sure they're good, and all the smart people have figured out how to make all that work. And that's amazing to me that we have people in our country that know how to do that, and bang. Boosters light up. Uh, boy, those people at Thiokol have been doing a great job uh, as far as I'm concerned with all their new processing techniques and all their new safety inspections. In fact, I think the first two minutes, ten seconds of this ride is the safest time during that time frame. It doesn't bother me at all. I've watched those people at Thiokol, really proud of them. And we sure had a good ride here. Mike? Right now, it's probably about a minute and a half into uh, ascent, getting ready for the solid rocket motors to uh, separate. It's kind of a nice shot here. You can see the shockwaves on the orbiter and on the uh, external tank. We, we pushed the limits this time a little bit more of the envelope, went to a higher dynamic pressure than we've been to before. At this point, it's probably about two Gs, two to two and a half Gs. The ride is a little bit rough on the solids. It smooths out uh, quite a bit once you get rid of the solid rocket motors. There they go. It's another close-up shot of the SRB SEP. That makes your front windows in front of Bakes and I go opaque. <clears throat> they literally just go opaque. A very uh, <laughs> bright flash when they uh, come off. And there they are. Of course, the Rocketdyne engines keep on running, and uh, boy, those motors are complex, and uh, I see all those people, and they do a great job uh, making those engines run. Our major activity on the first flight day, besides the launch, was to launch the uh, Tedris IUS complex. Here we are, we're up at 58 degrees, and getting ready for uh, uh, the deploy. Inside the cockpit, there's a lot of activity. It takes all five crew people working together to launch uh, something like this. Jim and I were the primary uh, people that were involved in checking the uh, IUS systems, making sure everything was uh, ready for deploy. And uh, Mike's job was to make sure that the uh, shuttle was in the proper attitude for the deploy. David was the person that did all the fine photography, and it's his work that we're looking at right this minute. And then uh, John's job was just to make sure all the rest of us were doing our jobs. And when we actually did the deploy. It looks like it's coming out sort of in slow motion. It's not. That's uh, real time. And the thing that always surprises you is how close it gets to the vehicle. And we were all looking out and commenting on how close it was to the vehicle. And then John puts in uh, some impulses to move the shuttle away from the IUS. And you can see this in just a minute as we begin to uh, uh, move away. Now, to do a deploy involves not only the crew people inside the shuttle, but involves all the people in mission control that are uh, monitoring systems. It also involves people out at Sunnyvale uh, who are monitoring the IUS systems. It involves people at Boyne. It involves the people up at uh, Goddard who are looking at the uh, TEDRA systems. So you can see it's a huge teamwork of people, a uh, big network of people all across the United States that are involved in launching something like this uh, uh, satellite. Now, our job in the, as a shuttle crew ended as soon as we got the um, uh, satellite out of the bay and then uh, a little bit later as we backed away from it. But then people had to uh, continue to monitor as the IUS was bringing the uh, TDRS on up to geosynchronous orbit. Now, after we got rid of our major payload, then the activity sort of focused down in the mid-deck. We sort of looked at the mid-deck as the place where we do our eating and our sleeping, and it's also our laboratory that we have uh, on orbit. And here I am working with... Uh, uh, a biomedical manufacturing uh, module. And this uh, module had flown before, and it's going to fly several more times. And it has uh, uh, several syringes 
uh, and then you can put in different samples. And the uh, samples that we had, we were growing different types of uh, cells and cell culture to see if they would manufacture uh, different amounts of enzymes that would be of use in a later type of manufacturing process. And the mid-deck is a very, very valuable as asset that we as a country have to do all these types of uh, experiments. As Shannon has indicated, we've, the, we turned the shuttle into a laboratory, flying laboratory after we uh, deployed the uh, IUS TDRS satellite. And here you're, you're seeing us perform, uh, Shannon and I are performing one of about a dozen physical science type <coughs> experiments. We had about an equal number of medical uh, supplementary objectives or experiments on board. This particular one is a setup for uh, an optical coupler that, that actually transmit, transmits uh, video and audio signals through fiber optics uh, and through, through uh, video couplers in the windows that you see here. Uh, this is really a test to find out if, uh, if it's practical to use uh, fiber optic technology to transmit uh, audio and, and video type signals uh, in and out of the cargo bay from the uh, crew compartment of the shuttle. You're uh, seeing a, a whole maze of fiber optic cables here that I'm manipulating there and, uh, and also the audio and video signals that come from the TV monitors and go to the video tapes that we have on board the shuttle. Uh, Shannon and I did a series of experiments using this equipment and uh, took about uh, an equivalent of about three hours of data uh, on videotapes to bring back for analysis to find out how good a quality we could maintain and what the practicality is of doing this in the shuttle. This is another experiment where we uh, undertook to analyze the, uh, uh, the propagation of flame fronts in solid materials, in this case a, an ashless filter paper that's inside a containment. Uh, I'm igniting it here with my with push button. You see the flashing light. In a moment, you'll see the flame. Uh, you'll notice that the flame is round. It doesn't point up like a candle flame. In zero gravity, a flame uh, forms a sort of a ball flame front as the paper burns. Uh, we've got a series of thermal couples attached to the filter paper uh, above and on the paper to determine what the uh, nature of flame propagation is in zero gravity. Okay, this is a view of the payload bay, and uh, on the right side you can see Cher. Cher was the uh, uh, space station heat pipe advanced radiator element. It's a mouthful. But uh, we took that up. It consists of two heat pipes, which you can see here, that uh, we tested uh, for use on space station. These uh, <coughs> would uh, reject heat on space station. You could use uh, many of these elements in, uh, in a row, basically, and the advantage is that there's no moving parts, no pumps involved. Um, if they were to take a meteorite hit, uh, the whole system would still work, uh, unlike uh, the systems that we now use on the shuttle, for instance. Uh, the results of the test were excellent. It worked uh, just as uh, expected. Another one of the experiments that we did for the space station was evaluating different kinds of cursor control devices for use on board um, the data management system on the space station. Um, we used a Macintosh computer and four different kinds of cursor control devices. Um, Jim Adamson, Shannon Lucid, and myself evaluated those uh, throughout the mission. Uh, one of the uh, privileges that we had on this mission was to fly some new software uh, and some new computers. The first time that the combination had ever flown together on the space shuttle. Uh, we've upgraded both systems and among the software changes that we've made is a new uh, digital autopilot for flying on orbit called an alter alternate uh, digital autopilot. And in this particular uh, uh, scene I'm working with John to uh, uh, do a series of 22 flight tests on the digital autopilot uh, to find out what kind of responses uh, it provides for the vehicle. This is just a little view up on the uh, flight deck that I put in just uh, to show you three really great people working on orbit. Uh, this is in between while I had different clocks running on different things they're doing. Uh, I catch them like this every now and then so I thought I'd capture this once on film. But it's really a neat thing to see uh, all these uh, human beings working in space so well with the ground, uh, trying to get everything accomplished. And uh, 
I just think a lot of that and think a lot of that capability that we have in the country. This is another demonstration of some physical principles in zero gravity. You can see a pair of long nose pliers there that are very stable in that mode. When you open them up a little bit, you can see that they've got two stable modes. You can see them flipping back and forth between those two. I saw David do this once, so I told him I had to get that on film. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Jim working on the aft flight deck for SSBUV, the Space Shuttle Solar Backscatter UV experiment, or uh, data collector, actually. Uh, it took both of us, essentially, to, to work this uh, uh, secondary payload that's in a gas can out in the payload bay. Uh, I would maneuver the orbiter to either a, a earth viewing attitude or a solar viewing attitude. And Jim would operate the APC to open and close the lid and start uh, different modes of the SSBUV. The experiment uh, was housed in which, what we call a gas can, which stands for getaway special. And you can see the uh, mechanical lid that we act actually uh, activated from inside the crew compartment using a uh, a little computer and uh, entering inputs. Uh, very fascinating experiment. Not exact, not designed to measure the ozone layer, but actually to calibrate other satellites and instruments that do measure the ozone layer. What we would do is is actually measure the backscatter ultraviolet rays uh, directly emitted from the sun and also then backscattered off the Earth. So we would actually look at the sun with the experiment and then turn around and look at the Earth. This was the uh, Battelle materials. Uh, for commercial development of space, uh, investigation of polymer membrane processing. The bottom line is in microgravity, they can get some idea of the physical and uh, characteristics of uh, materials and as a result, uh, develop uh, improved uh, membranes here on the planet to be used for, uh, to help uh, better filters for uh, liquids and solids. I think this is a, uh, that was a sunrise, and this is up on the flight deck. It's just a nice picture of the flight deck in space. Uh, me looking at the flight plan there, and, uh, and that was something I did a lot, and so somebody took this picture of me once. Yeah, we thought we needed a picture of John being the commander, keeping track of all of us doing our thing and making sure we stayed on the timeline. He's a great, great man to work for. This is down in the mid-deck. Um, again, uh, you'd see this a lot, different people trying to get... Uh, different types of work done all uh, in parallel and uh, so it's just a busy place on the mid deck. Shannon in the medical kit here, I asked her to get me some uh, sleeping pills and while she was getting them I thought I'd take a picture of her getting them for me. <laughs> you can ask her about... Sir, well, the experiments, that we, the medical experiments that we did had to do with assessing the cardiovascular systems. Um, this particular one um, was called blood pressure variability in which we uh, donned a, an automatic blood pressure cuff and a Holter monitor. Um, you can see we were wired for sound right there and for 24 hours, um, three different times during the flight, um, we had our heart rates and our blood pressures um, taking constantly. Um, Bakes, John and I uh, all did that. In fact, we had to do that pre-flight several, two or three times and we all, we've also done that post-flight two or three times. John's uh, giving a sign language there to say that that's his, it's measuring his heart rate there. Now another one of the uh, cardiovascular medical experiments that we did was running on the treadmill. Um, John and I did that virtually every day for about 30 minutes per day. When we did this, we donned a heart rate monitor that went around our chest. We also had a watch on our wrist there that uh, um, contained a readout of what our heart rate was as well as a time. Um, and during this 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, we would um, attempt to step our heart rate up uh, um, to a, a different, a higher level there. Again, John and I both did that on orbit. Jim uh, was a control subject. He did it on the ground. And so we've got some, uh, some good data of all three of us pre and post flight. I'm going to see David enter the scene here. Uh, while I was running down there, I looked around once and saw this, and I thought that was quite amazing. He was trying to beat me running around the world, I think. This was our hamster experiment. <laughs> it's much easier to run on that without these straps. Um, probably the biggest ex medical experiment that we had was called lower body negative pressure. Um, and in this experiment, um, Bakes and I would, would 
slide inside that can there, if you will, which had a waste seal that would come up um, and, and seal around our waste. And we could lower the pressure inside that bag to um, about uh, minus 50 millimeters of mercury, which um, is equivalent stress on your heart of standing up in 1G. Um, again, this took, uh, took place during four separate days on orbit. Um, and as you can see here with the uh, lower body negative pressure device there, it, it took three people, took up virtually the entire mid-deck whenever we did this. Um, you can see Shannon Lucid um, was taking some uh, ultrasonic images of, of our hearts while we were in that. Um, she's got a, an American flight echocardiograph machine that uh, is actually recording that data there. Um, you've got the subject in the bag and then you've got another person that is operating the controls down on the lower end there. Um, and entering the data, the um, heart rate and blood pressure data on board a, uh, a Macintosh computer. And again, this took up uh, the major portion of our days for four separate days while we were on orbit. As I'm looking at this, I'm just thinking, I'll comment, uh, the space shuttle is an absolutely incredible machine. I mean, it has tremendous flexibility, and uh, so, uh, you know, as, as you've seen here, we deployed a satellite on the first day, and then a tremendous amount of scientific and medical research uh, for the rest of the, the mission, and uh, a real national treasure. In fact, the only thing in the world that, that has this kind of capability, so, uh, boy, Americans ought to be very proud of this system. I might add also that I flew this on STS-32, and they've made some, uh, some great improvements, both in the comfort of the device as well as the, uh, the hardware itself. It's, it's more automated and easier to use now. This is a picture on the flight deck. Uh, in between experiments, uh, you'd catch uh, different people with different cameras here. Uh, Bakes has a telephoto Hasselblad lens. Uh, camera and Jim had an IR filter on uh, different people trying to take different pictures for oceanographers, meteorologists, and geologists all around the world. There are different requirements. Uh, this is a beautiful scene of our planet. It's just a big blue-white ball, basically. Blue planet's a good description uh, from the IMAX movie. That's a little sequence where I caught Mike taking some pictures uh, out of the pilot's window. Uh, this is looking into North Africa. You can see the earth limb there at the top. Uh, Morocco, Algeria, Libya. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea, really quite beautiful, our planet. And uh, of course, these pictures don't do it any justice, but uh, they're the best we can return to you. Um, absolutely beautiful, this planet. Makes you realize there are no international boundaries, because I don't see the boundaries of any of those countries there. and. Uh, but a real nice place, we need to take care of it. There's the Sinai, Red Sea, down into the Nile River Delta there. Really beautiful coming out of Cairo. Headed down south towards the, towards the Aswan Dam. Lake Nasser is coming to the scene here in a second. The real reason I'm showing you that is I'd flown on uh, two other missions and I never saw the Aswan. This time I did. <laughs> As John has insinuated, Earth observation is one of the favorite pastimes on orbit for astronauts flying in space. And I think uh, one of the things that, that impresses me the most about it is that since I was a, a young man going to high school, the geology books as a result of the space program have been almost totally rewritten and the whole concept of plate tectonics and shifting continental shelves have, has <clears throat> really been totally uh, rethought as a result of uh, observations made in space. This scene you're seeing right here is uh, one of the bad scenes. That's uh, all the Kuwaiti oil fires you know, burning, running south down into Saudi Arabia and uh, boy I saw that and as murky as it looks there that's just was the contrast that we saw on orbit. I mean the planet's beautiful and you got to that area and uh, well, it looked like the planet was out of focus. Uh, there's no question the Kuwaiti oil fire, fires are putting a lot of stuff into the environment, affecting the lives of five billion people and billions of animals and plants all over this planet. And uh, hope we get those fires out soon. You 
you're not seeing this real good, uh, but uh, uh, you're looking into the velocity vector. People always say, what does it look like on orbit as if you're on a space vehicle? Uh, well, you're looking right down the velocity vector here, uh, approaching the northwest uh, portion of Australia. Um, they're quite beautiful. You're moving at 17,500 miles an hour, and uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, one morning, uh, I was up eating breakfast, and while I was eating breakfast, this is what I was looking at. And I thought, boy, what a lucky person I am to be able to see this scene. Really a, a very beautiful planet, uh, except when you see a scene like we saw there in Kuwait. It's another flight deck uh, picture of uh, some people taking um, pictures here of the hurricane that we saw. Mike, you may want to talk about that. You saw that a yeah, lot. Yeah, we saw, uh, actually we saw about four hurricanes on, on our flight. This was uh, Hurricane FIFA, and uh, we had the opportunity to fly right over the eye, which was really quite spectacular. The first uh, rev or so that we saw this hurricane, the uh, eye was not really well developed. And then when we, uh, timing was perfect for us. As soon as we, as the eye became developed, uh, we flew right over it. If you keep your eyes on the top left of the screen, you'll see a shooting star just went by. It's kind of interesting to see that from space because you're looking down on it instead of up at it. You saw different stars there on the bottom is space and the planet, of course, is, dominates the upper uh, seven-eighths of that picture and this is a bunch of lightning storms going on. People always ask what do they look like from space, so I thought we'd throw a little of that in this time. And I think this is a sunrise uh, here and we're getting ready for entry day and you're going to see the payload bay doors coming closed. Uh, I think David came up with the camcorder and got a pretty good sequence of Jim and Shannon putting that in progress. So on the left side there, the payload bay door is starting to close. Every time I see all this, I wonder how, how, how does it work? There's so much complexity and uh, I think it's really uh, incredible. This is about two hours before the deorbit burn, roughly, about the time they close these doors. This is the entry time frame, and uh, we're about 250,000 feet here, and uh, out the front windows, you can really see the glow come up with the fire. Uh, it, it's quite an amazing ride. Every time you do it, uh, you say, wow, uh, what an amazing vehicle, and what a beautiful ride coming in. Jim took this photography. As John has indicated, you spend most of your time on orbit uh, falling around the Earth at about 17,500 uh, feet a second and uh, in order to get back to Earth the, the trick is to take some of that velocity out of your orbit and sl actually slow down which causes you to fall back into the gravity field of the Earth and in doing so you generate an awful lot of heat and some of the fire that you've seen shooting up over the top of the vehicle is a uh, symbol of that. Here we're going subsonic coming over top of the Kennedy Space Center and uh, getting ready to turn on to the heading alignment circle. That's about 90 degrees a turn to go. Uh, when I looked out the far left window, it was clear blue down there. And by the time I got to the front window, I thought I was going into the LA smog. Um, that's just what it looked like. Rolled out on final. Uh, boy, all our shuttle training aircraft uh, training we get, uh, all of our training in the KC 135 and all that really pays off here. You feel like you're right at home. Bakes put the gear down. And. Uh, Boy, what a beautiful, beautiful flying machine. To me, it's the easiest airplane to fly in the world in this time frame. But again, we get a lot of excellent training that, that it makes it easy. It's kind of incredible to think that that vehicle lifts off uh, on top of a bunch of rocket engines, pushing it out into space. Uh, you do all that stuff, uh, and then it comes back in and it lands like this, like an airplane. Unbelievable. I don't know where we got all the people that knew how to make that work, but uh, we do. 
quite an amazing uh, machine with tremendous flexibility to do many different missions. And of course, we tell you about that uh, every time you hear about a different mission. A lot of people wonder why it takes a crew so long to get out of the vehicle after we land. <clears throat> and of course, uh, going through the reentry and everything, we need some sort of cooling on board for all the avionics. And once we close the payload bay doors, uh, we don't have the radiators anymore. So one of the things we use to cool the vehicle here is ammonia boilers. <clears throat> and the ammonia being given off by the ammonia boilers creates a kind of a cloud around the vehicle. And in this particular mission, we had to wait a little while to get out because there was a lot of ammonia outside blowing out of the ammonia boilers. And uh, so it was, it was pretty smelly trying to get out of the vehicle. So we had to wait a bit uh, for that to clear. This little scene is showing you the crew working on that flight deck uh, after landing. Uh, we've got to do a bunch of little things. And uh, I don't know if you've seen that before, so we thought we'd throw it in. Coming out of the vehicle here, again, uh, I feel very privileged to have had such a great uh, team of people to work with up in orbit and, uh, and wish them luck in any of their future endeavors. They're really a super group of people. And here's just a scene of the Kennedy Space Team putting uh, the vehicle, getting it ready for STS-44 in November. 